Hey, Freedom Life Church family, we're so excited to have you join us here today. I'm gonna cover a couple of things on how you can stay engaged with us throughout this service. First thing I'd love for you to do is hit that sign up button and create a profile. And then immediately go into the chat room. We have hosts that are standing by, ready to love on you and help navigate you through the church online platform. Next thing is you can follow along with our Bible throughout the service. You can take notes and email them to yourselves. Follow us on social media. We have all the platforms. You can even share this service in real time with your friends and family on social media as well. If you download the app, you can always stay connected to Freedom Life Church no matter where you're at. So right now, without any further ado, let's see what God is doing today. together uh, inviting you guys out to this family flow night where we'll be talking about what's to come what's happening what's going on ways to partner get a lot of great information about this coming fall and what that looks like for our generations ministry uh, going forward all right that's a mouthful I'm done with announcements I'm glad you're here do me a favor stand up on your feet real quick come on we like to do this part. We want to make sure everybody feels like they're at home. So find somebody you may or may not know. Welcome them real quick. Shake some hands. If you're getting baptized today, please come to the front right now if you're getting baptized. All right. And this morning, we get the, uh, the blessing of being able to witness some baptisms. So I want to uh, encourage and ask all those who are getting baptized this morning to make their way up to the stage right now. If you're getting baptized this morning, do that. And while they're doing that, one quick correction uh, for our family flow, flow night. It's not the 14th. It'll be September 6th. So if you're marking your calendars, September 6th is the family flow night. So get more information about that. Uh, come on up. Yep. All right. We got some baptisms this morning. We're going to celebrate. Come on. I love it. All right, so I'm not going to make them say much. I just want you to say your name uh, real quick so they can know. We can all cheer you guys on and celebrate with you. They're going to be getting baptized right during worship, so we'll get to do this whole celebration thing together. All right, just say your name real quick. Uh, Brittany Castro. Brittany. Gladys. Gladys. Brenna. And Brenna. Y'all make some noise for all three. You guys can go ahead and head out that door right there. Yep. All right, let's go ahead and pray into words. We just want you to see the faces, get a chance to at least hear their names real quick. They're going to head there to get ready for baptism. Again, as they're getting baptized during worship, I want you to make as much noise as possible so when they come out of that water, they hear what heaven sounds like. Amen, somebody. All right, Pastor Freddie. I just have a special announcement I'm going to make right now. That way, after the worship, we can go right into the message. So uh, my mentor pastor, Pastor Scott, is here with us today from Chicago. Hey. Yes, and uh, I just want you to know, he did not get an easy assignment. We've been walking through the book of Revelation. And we have just gotten to one of the most difficult passages in the entire Bible to really contextualize. And he did a brilliant job of walking us through that last night. I, I pray that you are open and ready to be stretched and experience the power of God. But I just want you to know that uh, we didn't plan that on purpose. It was just where we happened to be. He didn't get stuck with the really bad one. But he did a great job of sharing with last night. And I hope you are ready to hear from him this morning. So if you're new to the church, if you've never heard Pastor Scott, that's who's speaking. Right after the worship, he's going to come right up and get right into the word for us. Does that sound good? All right. Let's pray. Father, we thank you right now for this time this morning. God, wherever we are in our journey with you, Lord, we thank you that this is the time right now. We can push all worry aside. We cast every care down at your feet. And Lord, we just open ourselves to your presence and your goodness and your glory. God, help us to shout with joy, God. Help us to be just like in the throne room, Father. We can see your presence, your glory all around us now. So God, we lift you up and we praise you in this moment. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Somebody shout amen. Can somebody raise their voice and release the sound of freedom in this place? Break 
couple of months ago, God released a revelation in this house that because Jesus is seated above every sickness, he's seated above spiritual darkness, above principalities, above all the tricks and the enemies of Satan. So guess where we're seated? We're seated right next to him. Right. So if Jesus is seated above sickness, if Jesus is seated above depression, I'm seated above sickness. I'm seated above depression. So when I say that it's under my feet, I'm reminding the enemy that he don't have no authority over my life. He don't have no authority over my finances. Cause it's under my feet. You are good forever 
your presence. Reveal your glory. Reveal your glory. Take us deeper in your presence. Reveal your glory. Reveal your glory. Take us deeper. Does anybody want to go deeper this morning? So reveal. Come on, ask him for it today. Take us deeper. In your presence. Reveal your glory. Reveal your glory. Somebody raise your hands and say, Take us deeper. In your presence, Jesus. Show us who you are today, Jesus. Yeah. Take us deeper in your presence. Reveal your glory. Reveal your glory. Say, we are hungry for your presence. Release your glory. Release your glory, Jesus. you to come into this space. Lord, we have come before you with needs. We've come before you with praise. And Lord, we ask you to inhabit the praises of your people. We ask you to open up your mind and your heart to the things that we bring. And Lord, right now, we cry out for freedom. We cry out for you. And Lord, in this moment, we ask that you would powerfully Open our hearts and our minds to what you have for us today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Be seated. Well, good morning, Freedom Life. It is great to be back here again. I love it when I'm here. Um, I just, it's kind of like family. It's kind of like having a major family reunion. So thank you for that. You know, um, I have a feeling that God is going to do something remarkable today. And so I'm going to actually ask you to have some faith with me. Can we do that? I believe that the Lord is going to actually show up in a very big way today. And I actually believe that he is going to bring freedom. We are going to see God actually lift the burdens from some of us today. My prayer is that we are going to leave a little bit differently than we came in. Amen? Amen. Let me ask you guys, how many of you guys have ever been really close to something powerful? Anybody? Maybe a huge jet engine or maybe you took a trip to Niagara Falls and you saw this enormous power of the falls. Maybe you were going to ride a horse, somebody thought that was a good idea and you got up to the horse and you're like, I don't think so, right? That's a powerful, powerful animal. Um, I had an experience of being very close to power a couple years ago. Um, I was flying into uh, my hometown, Chicago, and, and if you don't know a whole lot about like Chicago weather, I'll give you a very short crash course. It's almost always bad, okay? And so that's Chicago weather. 
And so we were flying in, and um, the pilot got on the intercom and said, hey, just so you know, we're going to get in some rough weather. This is Chicago. And he said, we're going to actually fly between two huge thunderstorms. One is going to go over us one way, and one is going to go under us the other. I'm like, cool. <laughs> and so he did. We fly right into this thing. I've never had that experience in my life, right? But there's this one storm swirling one way, massive. You can't even see the ends of it, right? Miles, 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 and miles. And there's another storm going the other way underneath. And the plane, when it gets into that pocket, just starts to shake violently, right? It is just slim. It's 737, just bang, 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 bang. And there's lightning like a capacitor between the two, these bolts of lightning, just hundreds of them. Bang, bam, 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 bam. And there's thunder in this. Now, here's the thing. I thought that was awesome. Like, I looked out the window, and my first thought was, I don't know how many other human beings have ever seen this. Like, I could be one of maybe a 1,000 people on the planet that has ever been between two thunderstorms. I need to enjoy this while it lasts, right? And so I'm sitting there and watching this, and as it happened, I started to think about God. And I started to think about the amazing, powerful nature of God. And I'm like, God, you are amazing that you have built a creation that is this powerful, and you're even more powerful than that. And so it kind of evoked worship in me to a sense of sitting there. Now, I wasn't flying alone. I was flying with another one of our pastors, Pastor Jamie. I think we have a picture of him um, up here. That's Jamie, really nice guy right there. Uh, He and I are close friends. We've pastored together for almost, well, a little more than 20 years at this point. And here's the thing you should know about him. He is really scared to fly on a good day. (laughs) And so as I'm enjoying all of this that's happening... A thought crosses my mind, wow, I probably ought to check on Jamie. This might not be as awesome for him, right, as it is for me. And so I turn around and I look down the aisle, and I'm not exaggerating at all. I see Jamie about nine rows back in a huge embrace with a large older woman, right? (laughs) Holding on to each other for dear life, and he is praying in tongues at the top of his lungs, right? And this woman is just patting his head, she says, baby, it's gonna be all right. It's going to be just fine. Now, you would think, you know, as a pastor, I, you know, have this massively compassionate response. I just, like, take it out. I'm like, yeah, that's awesome, right? (laughs) So here's why I I tell you that. One, because it's just fun. I like telling that story. But the other is people can have different responses to power. True? Like, we can have different responses to power. We can be around something or someone really powerful. And for some of us, we're like, that is awesome. That's amazing. Give me more of that. And others of us can be like, yeah, I've had enough. Can I tap out? Would that be okay? Do we have to do this again? And that's just kind of how power works. And here's the thing. Depending on what's powerful, it could change for you or I or whatever, right? We're going to talk today in a series that that we have been in on the book of Revelation at the end of the Bible, right? It's John's vision of the end of days, the apostle John who hung out with Jesus. Uh, He had a vision from God of this is how the world is going to kind of play out its final days. And in that story, we've come to the moment of where God's great power is going to be revealed. Enormous power, earth-shattering power violent power. And for some of us, that's going to evoke worship. For others of us, it's going to evoke fear. And we're going to look at that and we're going to say, man, I don't know that I like that. I don't know that I feel the same way about God. Like I look at what God is doing here and I'm not really sure that I feel safe with him. This is a passage that has caused a lot of people to doubt God, or at least doubt God's heart. This has been a passage that for a lot of people, they just said, yeah, I've read it once. I don't need to see that again. Done that movie, right? Don't need to spend a lot of time here. It's a passage that's hard. It's a passage that can cause us to be unbelievably uneasy with God. I'm going to ask you, if you can, to hang in with me to the end. We're going to take a journey through a passage that, I'll be honest, there's going to be some uncomfortable points. 
There's going to be some points that aren't real cleaned up. There's going to be some points that could cause you to have doubt or fear or some of those things. And I just want you to know that's okay. It's really okay if you feel that way. But we're on a journey, and if you can give me to the end, I think we can bring it back around to where you can see God in a light that maybe you can journey through this passage differently. Amen? Amen. So if you have your Bibles, uh, open them all the way back to the tables of weights and measures, like in the back there, and then just turn a few pages forward in that, and we're going to be in the book of Revelation, actually chapter 8 in there. And so... um, I'm just going to read from the verse 1, uh, but last week, if you weren't here, Pastor Freddie preached an amazing message. Uh, he did. Let's hear it for that. Pastor Freddie. Uh, on the seals, on the seven seals, and I'm going to pick up right where he left off on the seventh seal in the book of Revelation. And this is kind of what happens next. <clears throat> this is chapter 8, verse 1. It says, when he opened the seventh seal... There was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Wow, what does that make you think of when you hear there's silence in heaven for about half an hour? Something big is going to happen, right? If, if something, if you open up a seal and then like nothing happens and everything goes quiet, right? For half an hour, you're like, whoa, what are we doing again? What's going to happen? And then he, uh, John says, I saw the seven angels who stand before God and seven trumpets were given to them. So every angel gets a trumpet. And then another angel, meaning an eighth angel, who had a golden censer. Now, a censer is a word we don't use a lot. Um, It's kind of a metal ball that has holes in it, and you put incense in it, and you set the incense on fire, and smoke comes out. I think we have a picture of one, don't we? Uh, Up there, maybe, and it's on on a chain. Yeah, like that. Maybe if you've been to like a Catholic or Eastern Orthodox church, you might have seen one of those at some point, and the priest may do this with it, right? And smoke comes out. And so the angel has one of those um, in his hand. And um, he said, it came and he stood at the altar, and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all of God's people. And, and the, on the golden altar in front of the throne... And the smoke of the incense together with the prayers of God's people went up before God from the angel's hand. See, symbolically, and remember, this is a vision, right? And so everything, it's not like, it's not like a video of like the end of days, right? This is, this is a symbolic type of word pictures for what John is seeing. And he's telling us something that means something through pictures that he's trying to say. And in this picture, he's saying prayers... The prayers of God's people are like incense, that when they go up like smoke to God. And what's interesting is the angel takes all the prayers of God's people, the saints, right, puts them in there, and then he adds a lot more. You see that? I'm not sure what that means, but I wouldn't be surprised if that might even be the prayers of angels. And so all of God's beings are praying to God, and they're praying for the same thing. Do you remember what in the previous chapters when the saints are praying what they're praying for? What are they praying for? That the judgment of God would come. You remember that? They were saying, how long, O Lord? How long, O Lord, do we get to live in a fallen world that is broken where bad things happen to good people? How long, O Lord, are your people going to be murdered? How long, O Lord, are your people going to be mistreated? How long, O Lord, do we have to endure the suffering and the evil of a world that does not recognize you. How long, oh Lord? Have you ever prayed how long, oh Lord? I've prayed that prayer. God, how long is this going to have to go on? God, when are you going to step in? When are you going to say enough is enough? When are you going to champion the cause of your people? When are you going to stop evil in its tracks? When are you going to say no, not today? Oh Lord, my God, when is that day? That's their prayer. It's a prayer that God's people have been praying for thousands of years. Guess what? In John's vision, that was today. God says yes. It says the smoke of the incense together with the prayers of God's people went up before God from the angel's hand. And then the angel took the censer and filled it 
with fire from the altar. I mean, he just scooped up fire and put in there instead of the incense. And he hurled it on the earth. And there came peals of thunder and rumblings and flashes of lightning and an earthquake. He puts fire in the censer now, and he's got this chain. I have this mental picture in my mind of him just now swinging it by the chain on fire, and he throws it to earth. And an earthquake and thunder and lightning happens, right? It's a powerful display of force. It's pronouncing the Lord is answering the prayer today. The Lord has said today enough. No more. Evil stands no more today. This is the day. And then what happens next is each of those seven other angels that have trumpets uh, blow them, and they take turns one at a time. And if you have your Bibles, follow along with me, because I'm going to go kind of summarize through a lot of that. Great stuff there. If you want to read this, I would encourage you to study it. It is an amazing passage. But what happens is each of them step forward, and they blow the trumpet. And you shouldn't think of the trumpet in, in a musical sense, right? They're not playing a song necessarily, but it's a signal. It's like a battle signal, right, that something is going to happen. The trumpet blows, and then something happens. God is signaling forces that have been in place a long time to move. And so the angel, the first trumpet, he blows, and one-third of the earth is destroyed. The orchards, the fields, the grass, the mountains, destroyed. One-third of the land of the earth is destroyed. The second trumpet blows, and one-third of the sea is destroyed. All the living creatures and the ships in a third of the sea are all destroyed by the power of God. The third trumpet blows, and a third of the rivers are destroyed. There's like a meteor that comes down, and it makes them bitter, and all the people who drink from the fresh water die. The fourth trumpet blows, and a third of all the heavenly bodies, the stars, the moon, and the sun, are destroyed. And there's a major rift in the heavens, and darkness increases. That's a lot of power. That's a violent scripture, isn't it? There's a pause in the scripture where three times it is said, whoa. Not like woe to a horse, right? But like, whoa, this is bad. Whoa, this is even getting worse. And whoa, wow, I can't believe what's coming next. Because this, as bad as this is, as scary as this is, there's a lot that's coming. The fifth trumpet blows. And there's an angel who's like a shooting star that comes to earth with the key to the abyss. Time out. What's the abyss? <clears throat> the abyss, a lot of people think, is hell. It's not. The abyss, if you read in the Old Testament way back in the beginning of the Bible, is kind of like a supermax prison for disobedient angels, okay? And there were angels who were so dangerous and so evil that God's like, yeah, I can't have you running around. These are demons that we, he doesn't even, he just says, yeah, these are uncontrollable, and so we're going to lock you in the abyss. And so we've never experienced them. People have, for thousands of years, have never experienced these demons these fallen angels, because they are so wicked, crazy, and evil that God locked them away in a place called the abyss. But he now has given the key to the abyss. And it's opened. And he lets them all out. And the visual of this, this massive demonic army that comes out of the abyss is striking. So John says they're like locusts, but they have scorpions' tails, and they, and they torment people. For five months, so bad that they said that the whole world says, man, they just wish they could die, but they can't. The only people that don't get tormented by them are the people who have God's name written on their forehead, meaning they have the presence of the Holy Spirit. The people of God. Everyone else on the planet is tormented by them. And they have a king, and his name is Abaddon or Apollyon in Greek. And whether it's Hebrew or Greek, it means the same thing, destroyer. He's the destroyer of the world. And he is let loose at this point in time. Well, then the sixth trumpet calls, and a third of mankind is killed. Uh, another second huge angelic army, numbering more than 200 million, 
are let loose to kill a third of the people on the earth. Wow. That's sobering, isn't it? That's violent, isn't it? And this is what happens. This is the result of that. This is in chapter 9, verse 20. It says, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. Wow. Um, They did not stop worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver or bronze or stone or wood, idols that can't see or hear or walk. Nor do they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. Think about that. You got a set of plagues that has come upon the earth that has destroyed a third of the land, a third of the sea, a third of the rivers, a third of mankind, a third of the heavenly bodies. These demonic hordes are just running loose all around the earth and disaster has come. And the people who are alive don't repent. Wow, what's up with that, right? That's a bad plan right there. And see, here's the thing. I think it speaks to the power of sin. Sin's powerful. Can we agree? Sin is powerful. Sin blinds us and binds us. Sin is like having somebody just put their hands over your face. Because when we're deep in sin, when we are disobeying God, we become blind to our own sin. And good looks bad and bad looks good. Right? And we just don't see the right way. You ever been in a situation where maybe you're in a room and somebody comes up to somebody else and they're like, hey, man, you okay? Yeah. Why? Your life just seems a bit out of kelter. I'm fine, man. Don't worry about it. Right? That's sin blinding us. The deeper we get in with sin, the more blind we get. And then it binds us. It becomes master over us. See, what something that begins that we have mastery over and we just are kind of doing out of our own expression becomes something that starts to do things with us. Sin is, is alive and sin progresses in us. You see... The reality is that sin can be so pronounced in a person's life that they love it more than anything else. They love it more than God. They can love it more than their family. Have you ever been around somebody that struggles with drugs or alcohol? It's super hard to understand that, isn't it? Because you're watching somebody choose drugs over all the people who are loving them and trying to be in their life, and they will actually start to resent the people in their life and love drugs even more. That's true of lust, isn't it? You ever seen somebody that's like majorly into pornography? And they're like, man, I, yeah, I know I shouldn't do that, but here, what's the next thing they say? Is it really that big a deal? Because why? They're blind. Who's it really hurting? Well, maybe your wife, your daughters, the people that are objectified in making all of this, all of those types of things. Maybe them. But you what? I don't see it. I'm blind. What about bitterness? You ever know anybody that's bitter? Right? Bitterness is like drinking poison, hoping the other person dies, right? Right? And all of a sudden, the more bitterness you drink, you can't see it. You can't see it. And it's eating you and killing you inside. And all of a sudden, bitterness owns you. It's not like you own it anymore. That's what sin does. Well, God then, out of his great mercy, sends two witnesses onto the earth at this point in time. Two witnesses. And they come to share the gospel and the good news of God's kingdom with everybody that will listen for three and a half years. It's almost like God says, time out. I cannot believe you didn't repent. After everything that has happened, I'm going to give you another chance to have two people come down here and completely explain this to you, right? Because you're clearly not getting it. So we're going to explain this for three and a half years to you. And one of them has the power to stop the rain. 
start and stop the rain however he wants. And the other has the power to turn water to blood. Now, have you ever heard of those two things before? Yeah, who does that sound like? That sounds like Elijah, right, who could stop the rain. It sounds like Moses who turned water into blood. Now, here's the thing. A lot of people actually think that's who it is. They think that it is Moses and Elijah. Because like when Jesus was at the transfiguration, who came? Moses and Elijah, right? Elijah, at the point that his life was over, was carried to heaven in a chariot. Moses was not allowed to go into the promised land. Is it possible that God has kept these men alive for thousands of years and they're back on the earth? Don't know. I think it'd be an amazingly fun thing if it happened, right? So that's fun theology. I have no idea if it's true or not, but I think it's pretty awesome if it did. If it's not, it's two people who will carry their ministry mantle and will minister like them. And they will come on the earth for three and a half years and they will do miracles and they will proclaim the word of God and they cannot be stopped for three and a half years. And then Abaddon, that king from the abyss of king of demons, is going to come and kill them. And he's going to kill them in Jerusalem and they're going to lay their bodies out for three and a half days dead in open in Jerusalem. And it says the world, like CNN and everybody's going to cover this. And the whole world's going to see them lying dead. And you know what the world's going to do? They're going to throw a party. And they're going to say, thank you that these men are dead. Thank you that the men of God have died. Thank you that they are out of our life. Thank you that they are no more. Can we be done with the God thing? Can we be done with the morality thing? Can we be done with this? And they hold a party that these men are dead. Wow. So the wrath of God wasn't really amazingly effective at getting you to repent. (laughs) The explanation hasn't really seemingly moved you off the dime here a whole lot. Wow. But then after three and a half days, God breathes life into them and they rise from the dead in full sight of the world. And it says that everybody, amen to that, right? These brothers rise, and at that point in time, the whole world's terrified. Because maybe they told the truth. And they ascend into heaven like Jesus. And then the seventh trumpet calls. And the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of God. This is um, in chapter 11, uh, verse 15. It says, the seventh angel sounded his trumpet... And there were loud voices in heaven which said, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Messiah. Amen. And he will reign forever and ever. It is saying that the 24 elders who were seated on their thrones before fell on their faces in worship saying, we give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is, the one who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. And the nations were angry and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your people who revere you, who revere your name, both great and small, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. Wow. This is the powerful moment. This is the moment where God's kingdom comes in full. This is the moment that was prophesied all the way back in the Garden of Eden. Remember what God wanted Adam and Eve to do? to subdue the earth and spread so that God's kingdom would come and God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. What was the point of Abraham and Moses and Israel? That they would be a light to all the Gentile peoples and that they would create a haven in Israel where the kingdom of God could reign on earth and people would look at it and say, I want that and can that spread to my kingdom too? What was the point of Jesus? Jesus came and he went to every town and village and he said what? The kingdom of God has come among you, (laughs) right? And he did miracles to demonstrate that. What is the point of the church? We're the living representative collectively of Jesus. We are the continuance of Jesus' ministry, Jesus' life, and Jesus' love and compassion for the world. We are pockets in every tribe, tongue, and nation. We're the goodness and power of God reign. And we provide witness to the world that the kingdom of God has come, is coming, and will fully come. And on this day that John sees, 
hearkens to the return of Jesus. The fullness of his kingdom in the fullness of the world. Where every corner of it, God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. And evil is destroyed and is no more. Amen. And if you want to hear more about that, come back next week. All right. Because I didn't get to preach that. I got to preach this. So it's teasing you. But there's a whole lot more that's going to unfold, right? Because, like, evil's not just going to lay down. There's a lot that's going to happen to this point in time on. But that's not for us. Today, understanding the judgment and wrath of God. That's our biblical task. That's where we are. So where does it bring us out? What is the main thing that we take away from this? I think part of it is at least this, that God's judgment is 100% real. Can we deny that after reading this passage? Not really, right? God's judgment is 100% real. God's justice and punishment on evil is so severe and it's terrifying, right? I mean, I don't know about you, but I read through this and I'm like, Stephen King has nothing on this, right? <laughs> Like, this is legit scary stuff. And if it's not for you, you either haven't been listening or you don't believe the Bible, right? One of two things, because if you do believe the Bible and you have been listening, this is scary stuff. The earth's getting blown up, the sea's getting boiled away, the stars are getting ripped out of the sky, a third of mankind is dying, we got demons running all over the place, we got witnesses who die and come back to life in the whole world. It's crazy. Everybody who ever said, I just think this world's getting worse, you ain't seen nothing yet. Nothing, okay? If you're alive in this moment, you think the world is horrible, okay? Because this is horrible and the wrath of God is coming and you're like, man, I got to get out of the way of that. Power. Two responses. When we are connected to God, at peace with God, and know God personally. Yes. It is a time for peace yes. and at times even worship in the midst of calamity. Yes. Because we are God's people called by his name. I love the fact that if you had God's name written on your forehead, the demons can't touch you. Yes. They can't lay a glove on you. I love the fact that God sends two witnesses in the midst of this disobedience. Yes. Wow. See, here's the thing, though. The other response is this, and I get it. And if you're having this response, I totally get it. This is a violent God. This is a God who kills, like, millions and billions of people. This is a God who is bringing so much wrath, anger, and judgment on the earth. I don't know that I want to get that close to him. He's freaking me out. Where's the God that Freddie talks about? Right? Where's the kind God, the gentle God, the gracious God who forgives a thousand times thousand, right? Where's that God? Where's the kindly grandfather with the long beard, right? Where'd that guy go and how'd I get this guy? Got it. Can I just, if you give me a minute, I'd love to tell you a story. Actually, a story about my grandfather. Um, my grandfather... Uh, was born actually at the turn of the last century. And he was born in Pittsburgh to a very poor family. And it was exceedingly abusive. He grew up in a very physically abusive household. Uh, and his mom died when he was very young. And his dad remarried a woman who was equally abusive. So he was beaten constantly, he and his younger brother. And at 13, he decided he'd had enough. And so he left home. And he, this was in 1910, by the way. He left home, got in a train, just hopped on a freight car, and went to Canada. We've always, we asked him, why not Florida, you know, but <laughs> Canada's what it was. He went to Canada and became a lumberjack. No chainsaws, axes, and saw. Six days a week, summer and freezing cold winter in Canada for six years till he was 19 years old. That's how he earned his food, that's how he stayed alive. It's fair to say that Grandpa was a stout dude. When he was 19 years old, he decided he wanted something more. And he came home to where I grew up, a town in Ohio, 
to work in a lumber mill where the trees went. And he met my grandma. And he fell in love with her day one. Grandma was a looker, by the way. And so grandpa wasn't blind. And so he saw grandma and he's like, wow. And in the midst of that, they, he eventually wooed her, won her. They got married. They had two beautiful daughters, one of whom was my mom. And as my mom was a toddler and her sister was a little bit older, um, everything was good. And my grandfather came home one day from work. And my grandma was crying. And he said, what's wrong? And she didn't want to tell him. And finally, he pried it out of her. And she said, when you go to work every morning, the grocer, the guy that runs the grocery store, think small store, neighborhood store, like down the road at that time, comes in, because they left their doors unlocked at that time, comes in and sits at the kitchen table and asks me how he can help me every morning. And no matter what I say, he continues to come back, and I've been scared to tell you. And he smiled very sweetly, and he gave her a hug, and he kissed her on the forehead. And this is the family story, I'm telling you, right? And he said, this, it'll, be, it'll be just fine, sweetheart. And he walked out, walked down the road, came to the grocery store, walked in, and introduced himself to the man. And he said, I think you know my wife. And he walked over and locked the door and turned the sign to close. And because it's church, I'll just simply say, things got resolved. And that never, ever happened again. Now, here's the thing you might say, wow, your grandpa was a wild dude, man. He was a violent man. I don't know that I'd want to be around him. I don't know that I could trust him. You'd be dead wrong. My grandfather was actually a really loving man. He actually was really gentle of spirit. Uh, he was someone who loved people really, really well. In fact, when he died, thousands of people came to his funeral. And he was, he was a man that worked with his hands. He was a carpenter most of his life. There's thousands of people there. Do you know why? Because he had helped out that many people. When people didn't have money, they would come see my grand. He'd call a store and get it to open in the middle of the night, and he'd pay for clothes for the family to be there. Yes. And if you'd have asked anybody in my town about my grandfather, they would have said he was kind and he was gentle. And that's also your God. Amen. Your God is kind and gracious and loving. We oftentimes make evil seem less evil. Like a lot of times we kind of make it like, man, there's so many rules in this Christianity thing, right? Like, man, if you even kind of spiritually jaywalk, they cuff you and take you in, you know? And that Freddy's the worst of them. You know what I mean? That guy, man, what a judge. If you've ever seen somebody murdered, a human being's life, they took it all is. If you've ever seen a child mistreated, if you've ever seen a person or a group of people treated like dirt because of just something about them, you know what evil looks like. It is not okay for that to stand. Because when the kingdom of God comes, evil has no place. And here's the problem. Evil is not just a behavior we do that's like separate from us. Romans 1, I won't go there, but if you study it later, grab into that. Romans chapter 1 will tell you this. Evil and sin is not just something that you do. It's something that you become. It's spiritual cancer. Cancer is not a foreign body that comes into you and gives you a disease. It's your own body malfunctioning that is killing you. Sin is spiritual malfunction that kills you spiritually. And at a point when you let sin get a hold of your body to the point in your spirit and your mind that honestly God's wrath doesn't make you repent, God's explanation doesn't make you repent, the goodness of Jesus Christ doesn't make you repent, it has become not just what you do but who you are. And if you're going to end sin, you're going to have to do what God did. And that's awful because an awful problem demands an awful solution. And that's just true. But here's the other half of that story. God's judgment is 100% real and 100% avoidable. It does not have to happen to you. It does not. Because God is a gracious God. He could have judged us all. Done. At the beginning of all this. He didn't have to take five minutes, by the way. And he'd have been rightly within his realm to do so. But that's not what he did. 
Do you realize that's the whole point of Jesus? What is the answer to judgment? Jesus. What is the answer to God's wrath? Jesus. Why? Because here's the, you has already come. It just came on Jesus. Jesus took it for you. That's the point. The fullness, it's over. That's why the people of God can stand in the midst of God's wrath at the end of days and they have no death. You know why? Because you join that life. And that means you don't die either. So there, because he sat at the right hand of the Father on a throne. Do you know why? So you have authority. Because the Bible says you are seated with him right there. So death cannot hold you. Sin and wrath cannot touch you. And you have authority over every evil thing. That's Jesus. That's the good news of who he is. And one day his kingdom will fill the earth and evil will be no more. But right now, you know what the gospel says? This is exactly what Jesus says. That kingdom that will one day come and fill the entire earth can fill you today. All of God, or it wasn't just your wisdom, even very good inside, that God's presence is always that, that you can walk in, given that, right? But in the midst of that, the presence of God overcomes all. The invitation for God for you today, the message of God's wrath, believe it or not, is grace. What is the good news of the bad news? The good news of the bad news is grace is actually available to you. You can decide today that none of this has to happen. You can decide today to walk with Jesus. For some of you, that may be a really new thought. You've the I just I don't even know what to think about that. Okay, I get it. Some of us that may be something we've we've done a long time ago, but we have allowed sin to blind us and bind us. And so while that's all true for us, we are not walking in that truth. And sometimes we don't even think we can. I think God is present with us today, this is what I said at the very beginning, to set us free. For those of us who have never really had a moment with God or not sure if we ever did, where we really said, I want to be yours. Like, I, I want to follow you the rest of my life. I want you to be my king, my Lord, my deliverer, my savior. And I'm gonna live for you. Today can be that day. You know, for some of us, we've had bad church experiences, right? Freedom Life's an awesome church. Amen. Amen to that. Some of us have had experiences that are different than that. Where people who came in the name of God said things to us that hurt us. And they judged us and they were harsh with us or they, and that was really hard. And we've been like, yeah, I love this idea of God, but I'm not sure I want to be around those people. How about you don't be around those people? How about you come to church here, right? If that's you. Because this is a place where you'll be loved and you'll be cared for and you'll be helped. Sometimes we had tragedy befall us. And we say, God, where were you in that? If you weren't there, how can I know you're going to be here? We say, God, why did you make the world this way? He didn't. Come on, help us. He made it really good. Yeah. We messed it up. Yeah. You say, well, God, why don't you fix it? Well, we, he, he did. Now, I don't want to blow the rest of this series for you, but at the end of this book, it's actually fixed, okay? And so the story ends with God fixing it all, okay? And you say, well, why don't you do it now? Ah, now we're getting somewhere. Here's the thing. God is actually comfortable with us suffering for a little while so that all his children can come home. Is that hard news? You better believe it is. That's tough. That's tough to accept, but here's the thing. You saw what happened. When the day comes, the day comes, and it's over. Boom. God wants everybody to come to him that can before that time. And he is gracious and slow in that. And he's asking all of us who are his children to own that with him. That we will suffer to wait for the rest of our family to come home. And it's actually going to be worth it in the end. For the rest of us who have come to Christ and are walking with God, 
how free are you? Here's the thing. There's a, there's a rumor that has been going around for the past 30 years in Christianity that being a Christian just means you're forgiven and you get to go to heaven when you die. Okay. But here's the thing. That's actually not what Jesus said. What Jesus said is heaven's actually going to come to you. The gospel is not about you going to heaven when you die. It's about heaven coming to earth because that's how this book ends. Heaven is on earth, right? The seventh seal says what? The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of heaven. That's how the story ends. It is actually about heaven coming to you now, living in you, even in the midst of what you're in. That's the gospel. So if you are not free, if you are blinded by sin and bound by sin, you don't have to be. And today can be a freedom moment for you. Today can be the moment where God sets you free. So whatever that is for you, as you think about it right now, as we wind this moment up, I want you to hear the power of God, not as frightening, but as freeing. Yes. Amen? Amen? Because in the judgment is grace and the power in the hands of a loving God is to set us free. Amen. And if you wanna be free, Let's do this right now. We have our prayer uh, team come on up and our worship team come on out. And as we close this moment up, I just, I, it's on my heart. It's, I'm burdened. I'm burdened. And I'm feeling that there are people here right now. And I just am really sensing that God is wanting to do a work. And you're wondering, is that me? I think it is, if you're wondering that. And are you ready to see God do that? And if you are, let's start by a prayer and asking God to set us free and to not have to be blinded and bound by anything anymore. Amen? Time scares us to death. Lord, set us free from the things that have a hold of us. Set us free from bitterness. Set us free from doubt. Lord, we call out to you for these things. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
could be one short step away from a, a very transformed experience in your life. And I just want you to know there are prayer partners in the balcony. There are prayer partners here. You don't have to leave here today with what you showed up with. God had an appointment for you this morning. If you've never made a decision to say, I choose the love of Jesus for me, I would love for you to just get with one of us pastors, get with one of these prayer partners in the balcony or here we have lanyards and just say hey I don't know how to do that but today I want to accept that that love I want to accept the payment Jesus made on my behalf yeah. and we've told you that the book of Revelation is about one thing it's revealing the goodness of God and who Jesus is and I hope you caught that even today that even the weight of all of those trumpets and all that stuff actually just points to how much Jesus loved us. That he actually took that on him that you and I wouldn't have to take that ourselves. Amen. And I want to encourage you as we begin to just kind of unpack this in our own lives. If you're here, don't leave here if you need prayer. We will linger for you. If you say, well, I don't know what's next, but when Pastor Scott was sharing with me about the journey I've been on versus what I'm experiencing. That's why we do life together at this church. In fact, today you have an opportunity. Today, today you have an opportunity. We have life groups here. and It sounds just like what it is. A group of people that do life together. And today in the gym after, after service, if you want to go meet some of the folks that lead these life groups, that gather with people in homes or at the church and just say, hey, let's do life together. Let's learn about the Word of God together. Let's be in community together. Let's actually just get on this journey with other people who are going to be there in my worst moments. You need to be a part of a life group. I believe everybody in this church needs a group that they do life with. And today, I would say to you, if you don't have a life group that you're considering for September, don't leave the church today without going down to the gym and talking to one of these life group leaders and saying, hey, tell me about your group because I'm looking for someone to do community with. If you're here today and you say, today, you know what? My next step is I, I would like to just, just accept it today that they are going to follow Jesus Christ. <laughs> Amen. We've been believing God that heaven would invade earth. And so I want to pray for you guys. We're going to dismiss. And if you need prayer still, I want you to do something else. We believe that God has invited us to expect him to do what he said he would do. 
And so I just want to pray for you. I'm going to bless you, and then we're going to be disturbed. I'm going to ask you to come this way or get with one of those prayer partners. But as we prepare ourselves for next, I want to just speak a blessing over you if I could. Because when we put him first, he opens the floodgates of heaven in our life. And so I just want to pray for you. I just want to bless you. everyone who has served this weekend, has given us to do what only he can do. So let me just pray for us. Lord, right now, we thank you for every decision that was made this morning. Every person offered you some, t some of their time today to serve with their ability, offered serving our children while we were worshiping in here, Lord. Uh, they showed up early for prayer, Lord. They, they, they opened doors and they, they told us where to part, experience your hand of favor at work in their life, Lord. For every person who is praying right now, every person who is praying for their neighbor who doesn't know you yet, eventually, God, and said, I want to bring, I want to bring the tithe to the storehouse, Lord. Would you do what you said and open the floodgates of heaven in their life, Lord, God? For every person, God, right now, now, who, who is thinking about what they're going to do tomorrow with this message today. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would make it so crystal clear for them that they would just walk in obedience because you have gone out of your way to show them how to take what we heard today and apply it to life. Lord, I thank you that we can expect and believe you to do what only you could do because you promise and your promises are yes and amen. So as we go from this place, Lord, we thank you for your fullness. We thank you for what you've done. And we thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people say it together. Amen. Hey, we love you. Prayer is this way. Life groups are that way. But don't leave here without taking the next step. God bless you. Hey, Freedom Life Church family. I'm excited to share something with you today. Over the past few years, God has done some incredible things here at Freedom Life Church. And one of the reasons is your giving. You have given of your time, you have given in prayer, and you have contributed financially. Well, we wanted to enhance that and make it even easier for you. So we've established a text to give feature. And it's as simple as that. On your phone, you text this number, 1-855-440-4064 and the amount you desire to give and send. It's as easy as that. Now there are a few locations that you can give to. If you simply give an amount to that number, it'll go to our general fund. But if you wanna give of your tithe, you would type tithe and the amount you desire to give and send. We also have an expansion fund that if you wanna to give to that, just type expand and the number that you desire to give and send. We're really excited to see how this new feature can continue to enhance our partnership and to see what God does in furthering this ministry in the kingdom. So on behalf of Freedom Life Church, we thank you, we love you, and we're excited to see what God's going to do. God bless.